I'm Becky Hogue, and my mother, Betty Moorhead, in the front row. The two of us work with the library for this program, and it is our 32nd year in Batavia, as many of you already know, and we, there will be a 33rd year next year. We'll start planning in June for our next year's programs. So I, every month I just let you know I have a clipboard where I can take your email address, name and email, and add you to our list. We have a couple of 300 people I email um, every month just to tell you what's happening the next month. And then we'll definitely in August tell you what our schedule is for the coming season. We still have some programs. If you're new, I'll put some over here on the table and my clipboard. And this will tell you. So we have one more program after this for May. We run September through May, the third Thursday of the month, and at noon, obviously. So one of our longest running visitors is the same year from high school, Rick, so you're not that old. Right? I feel old. <laughs> Anyhow, Rick has been coming for years. My father, Lee Moorhead, who started this program with Betty, latched onto him and wouldn't let go. And I think he's kind of fallen in love with the baby a bit because he's so loyal and comes every year that he can. And it's almost over 20 years. <laughs> yeah, there were three years when he was hosting that um, Morning. program. Easy. No, the show on Thursday nights. Oh, wait, wait. No, no. The, <laughs> did you do wait, Chicago, wait? Chicago Live. Yeah, Chicago Live that he couldn't get here and there on the same Thursdays, but we got him back and I... How many of you have never seen me do this? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. <laughs> got some newbies. <laughs> um, and I'm disappointed. <laughs> the rest of you are all regular. <laughs> <laughs> it's like going to cheer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this year is very special. I'm, he was a good friend of my dad's. And when we talked about what he do this year, because he's shared all of his amazing, wonderful friends of that have been in his life, like Studs, Royko, and so we go, what are you gonna do this coming year? How about your dad? You've screwed around, mentioned your dad. We know he's a wonderful um, character on his own. And he said, okay, but let's add Ben Heck. So, uh, I'm just going to let, he didn't even bring any visuals, but he has something to hand out. I will put so my Ben clip. Heck died in 1964. <laughs> you know, the whole. Well, come on over. All right, my clipboard's over here if you'd like to sign up. And without further ado, Rick Kogan. I, I do have something for you when you leave here, uh, whether you like this or not. This thing, there's a. And you please, you don't know where you got this. If anybody wants to know how did you get that video, just send one someone sent it to me. It's a marvelous 28 minute long video of sort of a very promotional, self-aggrandizing video of the Daily News shot in 1950. I guarantee you you will love this thing. So, like what I have to say or not, you leave with a bonus. But there was no video of my dad. There was no video of Ben. There's some old shows of Ben Hex. So this is just in the very old-fashioned way, just me. And as usual, at any moment, if you want to ask something, those of you who've been here before, you, you know how this goes, right? Well, Rick, you know, when you just said, well, well, so let's start with Ben Hex. Here is some of his writing. Trying to determine what is going on in the world by reading newspapers is like trying to tell the time by watching the second hand of a clock. <laughs> ben Hecht again. <laughs> this is still true. He said this in 1937. 
I'll tell you a secret. We live in a mad and inspiring world. Ben Hecht again. In Hollywood, a starlet is the name for any woman under 30 who is not actively employed in a brothel. <laughs> ben Hecht again. <laughs> Probably still true today. I'm a Hollywood writer. So I put on my sports jacket and take off my brain. <laughs> Heck Tamer came to Chicago from his native race scene, Wisconsin, as a very ambitious teenager. He'd become a reporter covering all sorts of crimes and mischief, serving as a foreign correspondent in Germany, and creating the legendary Thousand and One Afternoons column for the Daily News. He cavorted with lowlifes and literary figures in the city, which he would later, kept ones you've gotten from those quotes, was pretty much of a cynic. But here's what he wrote much later about his time in Chicago. I have lived in other cities, but been inside only one. I once wore all the windows of Chicago and all its doorways on a key ring. Salons, saloons, mansions, alleys, courtrooms, depots, factories, hotels, police cells, the lakefront, the rooftops, and the sidewalks were my haberdashery. That's a guy in love with Chicago. He left for New York, uh, which was actually where he was born in 1924 to work with newspaper man and his good pal and drinking buddy Charles MacArthur on what would be the hit Broadway play that would forever and still define the newspaper business, the front page. It premiered in 1926, but before its premiere, while they were finishing it and you know casting the show, had got a telegram from his pal, Herman Mankiewicz, a newspaper guy who just left the New York Times for Hollywood. Mankiewicz wrote him this telegram. Come out here. Millions to be grabbed out here, and your only competition is idiots. <laughs> Heck went. This first script was for a movie called Underworld, Underworld, a silent film. It was only eight page, 18 pages long. But when Heck learned that the director had added at the end of it this sentimental touch by having the mobster give some coins to a beggar following a bank robbery, he fired off a telegram to the director. You poor ham. Take my name off the film. <laughs> the name stayed, and Heck would go on to have a film career so successful that he was often referred to as the Shakespeare of Hollywood. He was nominated six times for a Best Writing Oscar, winning, along with MacArthur for 1935's The Scoundrel. His other nominations were for, maybe you remember these movies, Viva Via, Wuthering Heights, and again with MacArthur, Angels Over Broadway, and for Alfred Hitchcock, Notorious. It is estimated, you know, the workaholic, he makes me seem like a slacker, it's estimated that the number of films for which had received writing credit was around 65, which also included Spellbound and Monkey Business. But the uncredited work for which he was paid an enormous amounts of money can be found in 146 other films, including the polishing touches on Gone with the Wind. Wow. He ran, obviously, what, what was called a kind of writing factory. He'd hire these other writers to work alongside him on so many different projects. And that, I think, that reminded him of the raucous newsrooms of his youth. He would earn as much as, and this is in the 20s and 30s, $125,000 a script, some of which he could bang out in two weeks. <laughs> that time he devoted, that extra time, to novels, plays, letters, and a memoir. Since we're in a library, and you may wander away after this, read his Child of the Century. It's a brilliant book brilliant book in which he writes a number of things. He writes about his entire life. He wrote this, quote, 
A movie is never better than the stupidest man connected with it. <laughs> Out of the thousands of writers huffing and puffing through movie land, there are scarcely 50 men or women with any wit or talent. <laughs> that, that is still probably true today. <laughs> The first Oscar ceremony was held in 1929. Peck didn't show up. He didn't show up to pick up the first Oscar ever given for screenwriting for the aforementioned Underworld, that 18-page script. It's also deemed to be the first movie that sort of started to glorify gangsters. The statue was sent to him a few days later. Uh, as a kid, my father always revered Ben Hecht. And when I was living in New York uh, in the mid-70s, a kind of misspent, living at Bowery and Houston when New York was pretty crummy, he arranged for me to meet Hecht's widow. Hecht had died in 64. So I got dressed up in what few clean clothes I had. And I went up to the Upper East Side and Rose Heck was this adorable old woman who came in and, and the first thing, she said, you're Herman's son. I said, yes, I am. She said, what's your drinking pleasure? <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I, I like to think, I said, well, drinking is my pleasure. Uh, I must have said, could I have a bourbon, Mrs. Heck? And I would visit her, I came, you know, every once a month, I would, you've got to come back, and she would tell me stories about, old Chicago and about Ben Hecht. Uh, she also told me that the prizes didn't mean, I was asked, I asked her about this first Oscar. He got the first Oscar ever presented. The prizes didn't mean much to Benny, which is what his wife and friends called him. He used the Oscar as a doorstop in their bathroom. <laughs> When Rose died in 1979, she donated all of Heck's papers, correspondence, photographs, and other materials to our own Newbury Library, where you can, at any time, the Newbury's gotten great. They've gotten much more open about allowing people in to see anything and everything. That's where Royko's papers are, too. That's where the Oscar is. I went over to see it last week to make sure it was there. Uh, that's where my father's papers are, too. And I think there's some wonderful thing about that. Herman Kogan and Ben Hecht together for eternity. He really was one of my father's great heroes. We had a memorial service at the Newbury for my father in 1989. My father was born in 1914, so he died relatively young, 74. He grew up in Humboldt Park. One of the most unusual things of my father's childhood that I learned was that his dad, a Russian immigrant, uh, ran a newsstand. Uh, he had been a doctor, but he couldn't get licensed here, so he ran a newsstand. And how my father and his younger brother, Bernard, became tennis players as kids is still one of the most astonishing things I have ever known. Because at the time, which would have been teenagers, mid-20s, let's say, there were four public tennis courts in the city of Chicago. They went up and played two courts that were near Angel Guardian. They took, uh, you know, two streetcars to get there. And I and he could never explain it to me. There's a lot my father could never explain to me. How did you and your brother even even discover tennis? I don't know. But I like the fact that there remain mysteries about my dad. I really do. I do. His brother, Bernard, who became a very distinguished professor at the University of Illinois, was nicknamed, I never called him Bernard or Bernie, but he was Babe, Babe, because he was legendarily, and I'd heard this from people they grew up with, the best stickball player in Humboldt Park, and Babe Ruth. Somehow they became tennis fanatics for their whole, whole lives. My father went to Carl Scherz High School, many of you may know that, anybody go there? Did you? way, way after my dad, obviously. Uh, he worked at the paper there, but he had, and his parents didn't have any money for college. 
So he saved. He was taken with newspapers because then there were roughly, depending on what year, seven, nine daily newspapers in Chicago. He worked as a copy boy for the Daily News. Then he had enough money to go to the University of Chicago, which at the time was $300 a year. Nice. Nice. My, my, my grandparents did not have to bribe anybody to get him in. There's <laughs> a free newspaper for you. Take it, take it, take it. <clears throat> and this is where he, at one point when I was a young man, I told him, after a few months at the uh, Circle campus, uh, where my uncle was the head of the English department, I told him I didn't think I needed to go to college anymore uh, because uh, I didn't think I was going to learn anything. He could have, he didn't, but he could have so shamed me into going back at the time because when he was going to the University of Chicago, he was living then in Rogers Park with his parents. He was working midnight to eight as a reporter for the city news bureau and graduating in three years, Phi Beta Kappa. It makes me think that, you know, okay, big deal, a Lincoln walk with no shoes or something. I mean, it's on that level for me. It's just, it's inspiring, but I just don't know how, how he did it. Both my parents, which I recently discovered because dates get confusing to me, worked at the Tribune. My mother, Mary Lou Cavanaugh at the time, she first walked in the Tribune Tower, summer of 1937, she had just turned 18. Later she told me, I worked nine to five at the Tower in a very real sense. I went to journalism school on the job. I knew everybody from the linotype guys to the top editors. She did many things at the paper. She worked in the travel department, the fashion department, writing synopses of movie reviews, writing memos, and handling many chores for various editors. She also got, she was very, very, very pretty when she was young. Well, actually, when she was 88, she didn't look too bad either. Uh, she got to know the boss. I, I think because she was very pretty, this is why she got to know the boss. Uh, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, he took a real liking to her, and he would often ask her to come up to his office on the 20th floor to uh, walk his dog, which he brought to work every day. It was a German Shepherd, and the name, here's a real witticism from the Colonel, Lotta, L-O-T-T-A, so named because she had had a lot of puppies. <laughs> he brought the dog to the tower every day from Cantini, his uh, palatial, beautiful estate. My mother told me this. She said the colonel was a presence in the building and he scared everybody half to death, but I liked him. Here's where my mother's life with the colonel gets a little mysterious. Uh, after he learned that I was taking college classes at night, he often had his chauffeur, a wonderful guy, a tough ex-cop named Bill Bachelman, pick me up after school and drive me home. At one point, when I was, uh, after my father had died, I asked if it was at all possible if my mother had, and not told me, had an affair with the colonel and that I might have been the result <laughs> of that affair, thereby enabling me to be an heir to my Tribune fortune. And all she said, she didn't say, how dare you or anything like that. She just said, oh, nonsense. Which still leads me to believe that she remembered the cop's name and the ride's home. That's another element of my life that remains and will ever remain mysterious. Uh, she left the tower shortly after marrying her first husband. In 1940, he was a guy who looked like she had still had a few pictures of him. He literally looked like a, a handsome, and Howard Hughes, young Howard Hughes was not unhandsome, but young, handsome Howard Hughes. His name was something, Lou Lowry, that's it, Lou Lowry. When she left to get married, and I still have a copy of this, and there was an in-house publication, uh, sort of inside the Tribune, that, you know, notes about new jobs and notes about this. They dedicated uh, 
half a page to the fact that my mother was leaving to get married. And it was under a headline that read, Marriage of Mary Lou saddens the boys in editorial. <laughs> makes me think that my mother may have had many affairs there. And there were the signatures of dozens of reporters on this thing. It's one of my most prized possessions. Of one signature, not on that page, was that of my father. He had started working nights as a rewrite man at the Tower in 1939, and thus, because my mother worked during the days and was riding around in McCormick's uh, limousine, I didn't meet her till years later. It was at the paper on a late night, June night, and this is one of the advantages of uh, the internet. Uh, you can, it would have taken me forever to go find old stories of my dad's. I didn't know precisely what date or any of this stuff. But I know that on one late June night in 1941, he banged out, and he was, as am I, even on a computer, a two-finger typist. He was the fastest I've ever seen. And that sound of a typewriter is one of the great romantic sounds of my life. He wrote a story about a young killer who was in jail for the murder of three people, including a policeman. And in discovering this story, I remember that when my brother Mark and I were young and we'd do something bad, like, I don't know, what could we do bad? You know, I hit a baseball through someone's window. He goes, you guys better behave or you'll wind up like Knifey Zawicki. <laughs> and we're like, huh? Who? What? Well, I discovered who that was and what that meant. So he's covering the murder. He covered the entire trial, the arrest and the trial and a lot of other stuff. Uh, he was in jail for murdering three people, including a policeman, and my father wrote, Bernard Knifey Zawicki squinted with his slightly crossed eye, flicked an ash from his cigarette, and grinned. I killed him. I shot them all. And I don't feel one way or the other about it. Good or bad, if I get the chair, it's okay with me. I never figured to get to be 21 anyway. That's why he tried to scare us when we were kids, but he never told us who Nike so he was. <laughs> what? We'll break another window. My father left the tower to go off and fight in the Marine Corps as a correspondent in World War II. I would try as a teenager and as a young man to get him to talk about the war. There are any World War II veterans in here? See, they're fading. Uh, he never did, he didn't, really didn't want to talk about it. He did talk about it with his best friend, Stubbs Turkle, who put what my father said, and this is how I learned about his, some of his, not all, experiences in the war. He wrote about it in the book, The Good War, which is a great book. If you have not read it, do so here for about the next three or four or five pages is my father in the good war and i can just imagine him talking to studs it was 1943 i wound up in the marine corps last place i ever thought i'd be when i was 12 all the kids joined the boy scouts but my parents refused to let me they said once you're in khaki you never get out. <laughs> I tried to join the service in 1942 because I was a newspaper man. I was considered essential for the war effort and exempt. I showed up at the draft board one night. Here were all these people sitting around trying to get deferred. I said to the stern old legionnaire, I'd like to have my status changed. Why? He said. You're 3A, you're exempt. I said, I want to be 1A. I want to join the Marines. And within weeks, I was on my way to boot camp, Paris Island, the asshole of the world. Why? I was definitely a non-macho character. It was right after Guadalcanal and Marines were getting slaughtered all over the place. I wasn't caught up in the patriotic fever, though I did want to fight Hitler. I was 30, I wore glasses, 
Everybody else was 17 or 18. Though I knew I'd eventually be a Marine correspondent, I went through 10 weeks, long marches, drill, the whole thing. My drill instructor, a guy with a big gut, was in the traditional mold, profane, vile, insulting. One night he called me, beer can in his hand. I want to talk to you man to man. He held a sheaf of papers in his hand. I see by these here that you're supposed to go to Washington to be a combat correspondent. What the f is that? <laughs> As I understand it, sir, uh, you write about the men in your outfit. He stared at me. He flung the papers on his bed and they flew in all directions. What are you going to do? Fight the f war with a f pencil? <laughs> no, sir. You, you shoot first and then you take notes. <laughs> I'm sorry about all the swear words in here, but we're talking the Marine Corps. He kept staring. You ain't going to fight the war with no f pencil. I'm going to countermand these orders. I knew that a general had signed the orders, and this guy was just a corporal. <laughs> then there was a hint of a smile from the corporal. I tell you what I'm gonna do. You look like a nice guy, but I'll bet deep down you're an awful prick. <laughs> he beamed. What could I do? <clears throat> yeah. I want you to stay here and be a drill instructor. You'd make a good drill instructor. Because you look like a nice little guy, but I think deep down you're a prick. <laughs> that fat face with those beady eyes just beaming. I was a drill instructor for the next three weeks. <laughs> Fast forward. April 1st, 1945, Okinawa. War correspondent. I was scared stiff very often. I remember being under attack and spending the night in a foxhole with a young lieutenant from Oklahoma City. As fate would have it on the following night, I was elsewhere to follow up on another story. Otherwise, I'd have been with him again. While I was away, he had his legs blown off. There was a sense of pride having been in the Marine Corps. The one thing I carried away with me was the selflessness of some of these kids with no great philosophical ideas about war or comradeship. I've often wondered what would have happened to me if I'd never gone into the service. Would I have been a newspaper executive? Had I not been in, had I not met some of those kids, I might have become a University of Chicago intellectual snob. But I could have done without this experience. Huh? No matter how just a war is, it is war. It was never a solution to anything. War. That's absolutely what it says in uh, a good one. So, my dad, who was wounded and spent the uh, six months at a hospital in Tsingtao, China, came back eventually from the war, and he worked at the Sun-Times, and he met my mother, and here I am. Uh, they met, they tell me, when my mother was having drinks. She had left, she was only married to this uh, handsome, good-looking guy for, I'll never forget when I asked, well, Mom, how long, when I found out that she was married, which was a revelation, and then, oh, how long were you married to this guy? Why, I was either, honey, it was either five or six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, what, was the colonel was out of town? <laughs> I, and I never pursued it. She did, she did not want to pursue it either. So the story is that, that my father was sent down from the sun to go cover a, a, a trouble uh, that was taking place at a restaurant called Ricardo's at the corner of Russian Hubbard. 
And he went down there and uh, saw what the trouble was. And what seems to have happened is uh, Rick Ricardo, the owner of the place, very charismatic guy, as I've learned, because I'm named after him. He became very good friends with my parents. That he had conf been confronted by a millionaire from Lake Forest who had driven down in his chauffeur-driven limousine and gotten out of the limousine in a tuxedo with no socks and shoes and gone into Ricardo's to confront uh, Rick Ricardo about having an affair no his last call <laughs> on September 13th, 1951. And in a couple of years, was living in an apartment in Old Town filled with that sound of the typewriter. My father was writing books. He banged them out, those two fingers pounding furiously, books about people with cartoon names and events that were often bathed in blood. He was a newspaper man, I knew that, but he was in love with Chicago and with its history and with words vividly often in collaboration with his newspaper pal Lloyd Wendt, who was a young reporter and would eventually go on to be publisher of the Chicago American. And they wrote books about those people in the history. He and Wendt wrote Wards of the Levy, the story of those first ward bosses, John Bathhouse, John Coughlin, and Michael Hinky Dink Kenna who have become the role models for, you know, Danny Solis and Ed Burke, but you know, they never matched these two guys. Never. He wrote uh, Give the Lady What She Wants, a history of Marshall Field and company. He wrote Big Bill of, they wrote Big Bill of Chicago, a biography of Mayor William Hale Thompson was one of the strangest, I, I don't care who the mayor of Chicago is, no one will be as nutty as Big Bill Thompson, who was kind of a crony of Al Capone's, and one day decided, because he had some kind of Western fixation, to ride a horse into the city council chambers dressed as a cowboy. Uh, certainly more interesting than Rahm Emanuel. Uh, he wrote Chicago a pictorial history, and on his own he wrote books about the Museum of Science and industry, about the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Chicago Bar Association, and a lot of other things. When I was a starving uh, cab driver of 21, he asked, asked he, uh, he didn't have to ask hard, asked me to collaborate with him on a book called Yesterday Chicago, which was another pictorial history, and it was an amazing thing for me to work with my father it's like something one would have done in the prairie like building a cabin with your dad i got to know him on a sort of intimate kind of level and just then realized how unbelievably smart and diligent a writer and researcher he was but he wrote before yesterday chicago and they may have that in the library it's a quick read it's just a pictorial history he wrote most of his books in this small office that was in the front of the apartment. And my brother came along right after we moved in. Uh, but I'll tell you, before I was old enough to read any of these books, he wrote these books on my head and on my heart. There we would be. We'd be standing on the Michigan Avenue Bridge, just, you know, father and sons out on the day. And I hear from him stories about the massacre at Fort Dearborn. There we'd be driving down 63rd Street and he was telling me stories about the Ferris wheel and the amusement park named White City and the World's Fair of 1893. Wherever we went, and we would always scream at my father when he'd come up to the suburbs to play tennis, side streets, side streets, because he would show us where the St. Valentine's Day massacre had taken place. It was just an amazing, wonderful way to grow up. Uh, we could feel the pulse of the past. So I hear a typewriter, but I also hear this other sound, the sound of the crazy parties my parents would have in the living room. And I remember my brother and I being, it was a you know, sort of railroad apartment straight back. 
a shotgun apartment almost and we'd be sleeping or trying to sleep and we'd be hearing this noise and all of a sudden my mom would come in and say get up now get up come on boys come on let's go say good night to all the nice people <laughs> We didn't know who these nice people were. They didn't sound nice from the bedroom, uh, but in pajamas covered with, you know, cowboys and Indians, and we walked down the hall into this living room that was so exotic, alluring, and terrifying at the same time. So it was a wild mix of people and conversations of ice cubes banging against glasses filled with booze, music pouring from the stereo, cigarette smoke, as thick as fog. The faces that uh, were in there and accompany my memory are many, for my parents had many friends, and some of them were famous, and some of them were talented, and most of them were writers. My mother, for a time after the newspaper business and after Mark and I were about four or five, became head of public relations at the Art Institute. So we'd have artists in there. So it was just, it was just the most remarkable way to uh, grow up. My father died relatively young, as I said, 74. They had moved after his retirement up to New Buffalo, where they'd been visiting friends over the years, and it was not the New Buffalo. Anybody go up there these days? It's so chic and hip, now I can't even stand it. It was like a real farm community up there, rickety bridge. Uh, I, I, I liked it a lot. Uh, he took a walk one morning, and uh, as he was wont to do, and at 74 years old, he just, which is frankly the way, if I want to model anything after my dad, that's what I want to model. So we had this uh, memorial at the Newberry, and it took my mother, oh my God, about six weeks to pull it all together. She would say, Do you want, and I, I didn't want anything to, I said, I'll, I'll speak, but this is your doing. Well, should we have cup or should we not have cup? And I said, I don't care. I don't care. She, she, studs, of course, spoke. Richard Christensen, the former theater critic of the. Uh, Daily News, Sun-Times, and Tribune spoke as he was really one of my father's main protégés. Uh, John Calloway spoke. My Uncle Babe spoke. My brother spoke. He was in a very weird place and he was a rock and roll manager. And he literally, in this very somber kind of packed house, got up and <laughs> And literally, he used that old joke. He goes, "Boy, am I, I just flew in from California, and my arm, my arm's tired," <laughs> which went over not well, not well at all. Uh, I gave a kind of a, a slightly uh, cups was the most amazing. And Cup and my dad have been friends for decades. And Cup gets up and and starts speaking like this. He said, speaking to the brick wall behind him. <laughs> and he starts, I remember it so well. I remember it so well because an old columnist from Chicago named Roger Simon, who used to write for the Sun Times, reminds me of it every he's in Washington now and retired. Reminds me every time. And Cup got up and said, Thank you, friend Cup's inimitable voice. Thank you for inviting me. It is wonderful to see so many of these celebrities and stars from the world of sports and show business here to honor Herman. It tells me again, give the public what it wants. <laughs> like, huh? What? And then he told, he, then, then he rambled for a little while longer and then read a poem and Essie, his wife, kept, kept screaming, turn around, turn around, you idiot, turn around. So eventually he faced the microphone and talked. It was wild. And so I gave a, uh, you know, the, the, just that I was mad, you know, I didn't get a chance to say goodbye and I didn't get a chance to say thanks and all that jazz. Uh, I am now having to lived a sufficient amount of time and seen a lot of people close to me die. Again, that's the way I want to go. Uh, if my daughter Fiona doesn't get a chance to say goodbye to me, that's okay. That's okay. She'll live. Uh, but it was just obviously such an angry speech that after it was over, 
and while people are still milling around, I was the last to speak. Went over to the window that was over there and to, to smoking a cigarette. And Ann Landers, who's a great friend of my parents, I was not yet her editor, she just knew me from the time I was a kid, came up and and said and put a, a folded piece of paper in my hand. You take this and you do you do what I say, you call these people. And I look at these numbers and there are two names like Johansson and I go, who, who, who is this? These are the two best psychiatrists in Chicago. <laughs> you need help. <laughs> good old Effie. Uh, good old Effie. So after my father died, there were then a number of people, his friends, some, some famous, some not. Uh, this is a few, and most of the ones I picked out are, uh, or, I tell you about my dad. With his rough and sardonic exterior, his bulldog tenacity, Herman Kogan was perfectly typecast as a Chicago newspaper man, and for more than 50 years he played that role to singular perfection. But Kogan was no mere, more a stereotypical Chicago journalist than Carl Sandburg, Ben Hecht, Mike Royko in whose exalted company he belongs. Someone else said, historian, biographer, columnist, book and theater critic, war correspondent, storyteller, radio host, TV executive, and violinist, whose last semi-professional engagement he liked to recall was in a Chinese whorehouse. <laughs> Kogan was much too versatile and energetic to be categorized simply as a newspaper man even though that's how he always preferred to be identified. That's a trait I still have. Someone else said, he had a strong paternalistic impulse, first of all toward his immediate family, but also toward the family of writers, both famous and obscure. One of the obscure ones was a guy named Jack Starr. You don't know that name. He first encountered my dad when they were cub reporters competing on different newspapers. They were covering a police raid or fires. His initial, Jack's, Jack's dead now too, Jack's initial impression of my dad was of a front page type. Chicago police reporter, brash, superficial, and slightly dissipated. Later, Starr recalled how mistaken that reaction was when he found himself working on the Sun-Times with my dad. He was the only rewrite man. What they used to do, for those of you, you guys are gonna love this Daily News thing. Uh, what they used to do, reporters would call in stories and call in some very articulately, some drunk, and the rewrite men, incredibly important, were charged with taking those notes over the phone and writing the stories. Uh, it was a thankless but uh, essential job. So Jack was sitting on the rewrite desk with my father and he said, he was the only rewrite man to read books or magazines while waiting for an assignment. <coughs> He also said, besides writing a mean story about a love triumph that ended in death, Herman was one of the newspaper's few writers who was able to interview a Nobel Prize winner or understand the Red Scare at the University of Chicago. It is hard, and I was thinking about it, to sum up a life with words. Ten words, a million words, I don't know. But something Lloyd Wendt said about my father uh, kind of sums it up. Herman Kogan was the finest man I have ever met. He was never afraid of anything. And that's pretty good, but I want to tie this all together and end with something Ben Hecht wrote is a poem. He also wrote poems. A poem about the life of the newspaper man. We know each other's daydreams and the hopes that come to grief. 
for we write each other's obits in their God Almighty brief. <laughs> now, what else you want to know? <laughs> Classic Kogan 45 minute speech. Man. Classic. Classic. I hope I told you something about your dad. I mean, he, in many ways, he remained, parts of him remained mysterious to me. He was married once before something I didn't realize until he and I were having, I think I knew it, but we never talked about it and we were having lunch. I think I had a job at the time, uh, <laughs> having lunch at the Wrigley Building restaurant. And this, this horrifying, horrible woman comes up to us and goes, hello, Herman, and starts saying, is this Rick? And, and I am, and she walks away or waddles away. And I go, well, damn, who is that? He goes, oh, that's my first wife. I have nothing to do Jesus Christ! Uh, I never did get to meet my mother's uh, first husband. Handsome man. Anything about, yeah, sure. How old is Fiona and what's she doing now? Fiona is uh, 14 years old. Uh, she's, she has not dyed her hair purple yet. Uh, she does not have any tattoos. She is at Jones. She's a freshman at Jones and Jones College Prep in the South Loop, one of those, you know, hard to get into elite schools, but she did, and she loves it. She is excited because she had to apply for journalism in her sophomore year, and they have a paper there. The, the paper at Jones, I went in the offices, it's as nice as the Tribune. I'm not kidding. I go, wow, look at all these computers. Uh, and her only point, I go, oh, Fiona, that's good. What do you want to do for them? She goes, well, Dad, I'd like to illustrate stories and write stories, too. And I go, oh, honey, that's great. She goes, I have a question, though. You know, three more years of high school, four years of college, it's seven years. When I get out of college, you think they'll still be newspapers? <laughs> <laughs> good question. No, it's a really good question. I don't know. Yes? Sort of in that vein, I have a granddaughter that's considering journalism in junior high school. Any advice? She's in junior high school? Junior in high school, 17 years old. <laughs> There is always, always going to be journalism. The, what form it takes, and I, it has not, well, when you look what the New York Times, for instance, is doing with, uh, they have more than a million online subscribers who only get it online. I'm a, I'm a paper guy. I will hate to see when a newspaper is no longer on paper, but it's bound to change form. And I think they're in a better position than someone who got out of college four years ago is. Yeah. Four years ago, it was just total chaos. I mean, the Tribune was undergoing astonishing and sad layoffs kind of across the board. I tell them to stick with it. I tell them to, you know, to not, if they are focusing on, it's it's a cool thing. I will give you that it's, I don't know if they have a paper at the high school, but it's a very cool thing to see your name uh, on, in print like that. They should get used to seeing it uh, in another form. But I am, I am fully confident. I think journalism is more essential than ever. We, we live in uh, in this whole fake news to do, you know, whether you, it's more important than ever and tell them I think it'll be a great career for them. I, I cannot tell you where they're gonna work, but it, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna remain and I think it's going to thrive, frankly. Yes? Have you come across the, uh concept that, or, or, and, and what do you think of it, that uh, the death of local newspapers is causing part of the polarization in this country? Kind of a stretch. You mean local by, you know, the Batavia Star or whatever the Batavia? Well, I'll tell you something. I, I think the future of small local papers is is very healthy. I think there's been a constraint. I absolutely do. When you go look at, and I, I don't know anything about business, but when you look at who is buying newspapers now, people are buying small chains of small local papers. And that's very encouraging to me. Uh, 
I think most of the polarization has come from from the you know incessant 24-hour cable news stations. I don't think there's any any question about it. I, I think that it, it used to you couldn't always go to a newspaper whether you were a Republican or a Democrat. You know, you could if you were a Republican, you could go to the Tribune, it, but you wouldn't get it every single day. You know what I mean? And you wouldn't get it 24 hours a day. And you could find competing voices here. I know people who only, only watch MSNBC, and I think they're nuts. And I know people who only watch Fox, and I think they're nuts. But it's a lot easier to sit and listen to people who feel like, and who reflect your own values. And I think that's the polarization. I mean, you'll hear it today. I mean, watch TV tonight after the, the Mueller report's been released and see what it is. I, do I think it's healthy? I don't. You know, look, this last Chicago mayor election is important an election is in my lifetime. You know, 33% of eligible voters voted. 33% of eligible voters. Uh, it's shameful, I think, and people aren't engaged with politics the way they should be. I mean, it, 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 seriously, you have 90 something percent. There should maybe some people can't vote because they're sick or something's going on, but it should be 90. It's just well, sad, especially yes. Especially with early voting. I know. Yeah. Yes, sir. The uh, reporter that I'm thinking of is a guy that's trying to get a prize. I can't hear you. I'm old. I can't even. No, I'm thinking about as a reporter, film reporter possibly, that is, is out searching stories with uh, little or no evidence or uh, the type of people they need to back up their stories. And it seems to me that everybody's working for a policy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a, a real trend toward uh, self-aggrandizing reporting of not doing the lay work and searching and grasping for prizes. You know, the whole kind of gotcha kind of journalism is I think what you're talking about. You know, good reporting takes a lot of lay work and it really takes a lot of lay work and in, in essence, uh, ergo a lot of money. You can't have a great investigative piece by by going to, you know, you can't write the jungle, for instance, in Claire's, Upton Sinclair's great book about the stockyards, by like a, sending a drone over there to see what it looks like. Yeah, it looks bad, but you can't, you can't base it on that. There, I'll tell you a great story about this one. It, it gave me chills. <clears throat> when I was the uh, features editor of the Tribune, Miss Fiona had just been born, or, you know, she wants to learn to swim, and. So I'm thinking, okay, well, we'll find some pools. So I thought the easiest way to find some pools is to send one of my reporters out to, uh, I said, go find some you know, kid-friendly pools in the city. It's not a bad idea for a story. I'm not the only person having a kid. So he, he turned in the story, and in the story, and remember, this is when we were in, still in the Tribune Tower, he writes, one fine place is the rooftop pool on the inter of the Intercontinental Hotel. <laughs> that's the pool, he didn't know this, but that's the pool I learned to swim in. I know that pool as well as I know Lake Michigan. It's on the 11th floor. It's at its shallow end, four feet deep. It is like you want your kid to die, and that's a good place to do it. So I come to him, his name was Glenn Jeffers, he doesn't work there anymore, and I said, what is this? Well, it's a, it's a fine, a really fine pool. I go, Glenn, it's on the 11th floor, it's not on the roof, it's four feet deep at its lowest end. How did you get this information? Uh, well, uh, well, uh, uh, and as he's well, ah, uh, well, ah, uh, well, eyeing, I said, it's next door. <laughs> it is 40 feet from your desk. Uh, well, I, you know, I went online, saw some pictures and stuff, and that, that is literally a moment I will ever recall when I thought, oh boy, you know, this is a kid who went to journalism school, 
But that's kind of not as an important matters, but that's kind of to your point, you know, just lazy. And you think, and there are too many people who think everything is available on the internet. Everything, no matter what you're writing about. <clears throat> you know, you want to write a biography of someone, Wikipedia, I, I don't mind Wikipedia, but it's not the final word on things. I went down, I was thinking about something <clears throat> a few weeks ago, the election's coming up and everybody's writing about it, but I thought, what, what, what should I, I want to do something about the election. So I thought to myself, you know what I'm going to do, I'm going to go down and see, like, Take a look at the papers of Richard J. Daly, <clears throat> the archives. They didn't quite offhand know where they were. They happened to be at University of Illinois, Chicago Circle. And so I go down there, and the and it, you, if you guys are ever downtown, I'd do it too. They were, his papers are pretty well organized. Richard M., of which they keep receiving, uh, a lot of junk, uh, some of the worst statuary and paintings, and it's like the family dumps. <laughs> what do you do? You don't want to throw out this strange little statue from the king of Bulgaria or whatever. <laughs> but the daily stuff was, was astonishing because the library, and there are many libraries, libraries, I said, well, isn't all this stuff digitized? No, it's in boxes. But why, why is that? Libraries in the main do not trust. I don't know if you can tell me this about that. That's, they believe that if everything is digitized, there is a chance that it could vanish forever. Think about it, that something will crash. And then, so they said, well, you want to see some letters? I'm not sure. <clears throat> So I go, don't I need gloves or anything? No, no. And anybody can go there. It's open to the public. You don't have to make a reservation. And first I see Daly's license plate, which is 788, comma, 543. And I'm going, what's the significance of that? The number of votes he got when he won his first election in 1955. And he kept, you used to have to renew a plate every year, remember? It's not a sticker. And he kept it all the way till the day he died. And I thought, that is so sentimental, but it's also so cool. Uh, so they hand me, they go, here, pick a letter. And there, there doesn't, I, I pick a pull letter up. It is a letter written to Richard J. Daly in October of 1960. Dear Rich, thanks a lot for holding the uh, uh, candlelight parade for Jack. You've been so good to our family and blah, 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 and let's hope for the best in November. And I'm going, Jesus Christ, this is a letter from Joseph P. Kennedy written to Richard J. Daly about JFK. And then I said, well, do you have any, what candlelit parade? They go, oh, here, look at these pictures. I'm like, oh, my God. So much more exciting than reading about it on Wikipedia. I, it was amazing. I literally almost was tingling holding that letter, signed Joseph P. Kennedy. Uh, what was the point of that? <laughs> It was getting out of the office. I mean, that's part of it, too, of getting out of the office and doing the, the late work. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I love your show on Sunday night. Oh, that's thank what you. I want to know. What is going to happen to radio? What's going to happen to radio? Yes. Well, <clears throat> certainly AM uh, is uh, on life support. Yeah. yeah. AM is on life support, whether or not podcasting. See, the, the, any of you listen to podcasts? There are some very, very good ones out there. There are also some painful ones out there where everybody in the world, WGN has a lot of podcasts, and, and I'll tell you frankly that the reason they have so many podcasts is people will come to them and say, hey, I'd like to have a show on the radio. And because they're not good enough to have a show, they go, hey, why don't you have a podcast? And, and that satisfies their ego. I'm, I'm dead serious. Uh, in the main, I mean, podcasting should be kind of a, a, you know, the minor leagues where people can hone their craft and eventually get on regular radio. Uh, 
Are they on the computer or the smartphone? I don't know where to get a podcast. Either one. Yeah. I mean, they're on your but smartphone. That's the only, those are the only sources? The Computer, yeah, yeah. 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 the internet. So sort of, yeah. on your phone, you should have a little thing that says, I don't use mine, but says podcast. And then you just search. And the great thing about it is, for those of you who, who do listen, and I've listened to a number of them, there are some that are just, it's a great way of storytelling because most of them don't need, you don't need money, you don't need advertising. Uh, you know, which is the burden of some of these other shows. You know, if I have to read, I mean, some of the commercials I read on, on my Sunday night show are just hard, are ridiculous. I'm thinking, really? Someone's really going to buy a car and listen to it on the radio? Uh, it's, changing, it's changing radically. How? If I knew I'd, I'd run a station, I don't know. I think podcasting is a big part of it, but but not too many people are able to monetize their podcast. So it's like you do it for free for a while, or you have a really insubstantial ego, and you literally believe that millions of people are listening to you rambling about what you ate for breakfast, uh, or what you think about the election or something. Uh, it's changing. Podcasting is going to be a huge, huge part of it. But that, too, will eventually have to be commercialized somehow. Do you know what I mean? I, you can't, it, it, though it is, all you need is a microphone and a platform. And you can search for anything. I mean, it, I, I, I would defy you to come up with a subject that isn't the subject of a podcast. You know, if you want... You know, serial killers in Georgia in the 1920s. I'll bet you could find something about it. I'm dead serious about that. Yes, sir. So, were you uh, surprised or shocked about the demise of Johnson Publishing? No, I think John was a, a, an amazing guy. Uh, first, to come up with an idea like that, to and the way he did it, he, he, he hocked his mother's furniture for that first edition. And with what little money he had left after publishing the first uh, edition of Ebony, he sent guys, mostly guys, around to all the city newsstands to buy up every copy they had. Uh, he was a visionary, but I think his daughter did not have her nose. I like her, she's a nice person, but did not have her nose to the grindstone. I think, you know, it, 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 that is a publication that really, really had to change in some kind of way. Because I think for the, the new generation of African Americans, it just didn't seem relevant to have, you know, yet another piece about Smokey Robinson or something. This magazine was incredibly important in 1955 when Mamie Mobley walked into their office with these photographs of her son, Emmett Till, beaten to death in Mississippi, and said, I want you to, if you've, if you've never seen them, they're the most, they're worse than any horror movie you've ever seen. They are grotesque. And she gave them to John Johnson and said, I want you to publish these. And all of his people were like, we can't, no, we can't publish something like this. And he did. And I literally believe that that was one of the sparks to the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Just that people, not just African Americans, but everybody saw what had happened to this little 14 year old Chicago kid in Mississippi for, for maybe whistling at a white woman. Maybe, I still don't believe that. Mm -hmm. But it was an incredibly influential, I'm sad to see it go. I mean, I'm sad to see, it, it, but it was, it's like one of those things, it's like the Daily News or something, it was of its time. What I have for you here when you walk out, and I know you have a Xerox machine here, so if you run out, someone go Xerox some more. Uh, it is a link to a, an astonishing, these kids who run a thing called the Chicago Film Society are in the business of saving and trying to uh, repolish old films of all sorts. In a basement, they found uh, a thing saying the Daily News. 
and what it is is in 1950 the daily news did a, a promotional documentary about itself directed by a, a people at a company here that did a lot of work for sears and everything else and it's way before my time uh, it, it was made in 1950 but it's fascinating and there are some things in it that are just too much fun you just you you, you will laugh but it does uh in 28 minutes give you a real jolt of what a newspaper was to a city like chicago they at one they couldn't have there's one part where the two actors because they didn't trust the real reporters and writers john knight the famous john knight who owned the daily news and then began the knight ritter chain of newspapers is in it typing in a typewriter typing an editorial and but he's the only one they didn't trust uh, reporters and and real ones to talk i suppose so they hired two actors and the two actors are sent out to to do a expose of skid row and many of you remember skid row on west madison and what is now the unbelievably chic west loop and <laughs> they go and then and john the editor goes okay now grow your whiskers and get some shabby clothes and get out there and do an investigation <laughs> and they dramatize the whole investigation i mean it's a really funny hey i'll watch it this afternoon you'll get a real real kick out of it that's it, eh, folks? Yeah. Go home. Oh. Go Grab this. It's a very easy link to get. And if anybody asks you where you got it, just say, I don't know, somebody sent it to me. <laughs>